Hi everyone, and welcome back to Know Your Data, the data literacy project series where we help you unpack the data, charts, and terms that all of us see every day about coronavirus. I'm Kevin Hannigan, the Chief Learning Officer of Click. I'm joined by our good friend, Alan Schwartz, a former Pulitzer Prize nominated reporter for the New York Times and a fellow data guy. We received some requests from viewers from our last episode. And actually one of them asked us to explain not an entire phrase, not even just a word, just one letter. And that letter is the letter R. It's something we all keep hearing and is key to so much about coronavirus in the future. So with that, we'll have Alan get us started. Thanks, Kevin. It seems as if almost every headline we see these days mentions R in some way. Here's a few. What is coronavirus's R number? Coronavirus R, is this the crucial number? The R naught factor, why keeping R naught low is critical. And in my old New York Times, R naught, the messy metric that may soon shape our lives. So let's talk about what R really is. R stands for reproduction number. Technically, it's R naught with the subscript, but hey, we're all friends now, so uh, let's just shorten it. It stands for reproduction number, and it's actually quite simple. It's the average number of people who, when one person is infected with the virus, that person passes it on to. So if an R is three, then one person on average will infect three other people. And it's a very rough, but at least instructive estimate of how fast a disease might spread. For some viruses, it's relatively low, like the flu, it's about one and a half. But for measles, it's like 15. Measles spreads like wildfire without vaccination. COVID-19 has been estimated between about three and six. Now that's if we don't do anything to stop it. And that's vital. Whatever a virus's inherent R might be, it can be decreased by all sorts of human behaviors. How quickly infected people isolate, how often they wear masks, maybe develop immunity, things like that. It's a pretty long list. And lastly, the reason you keep hearing so much about R is that this is a crucial number that countries and states are looking at when they think of loosening social and economic restrictions in various ways, and then monitoring how that reopening is going moving forward. But please remember everyone that when we talk about different values of R, we are not saying which levels or thresholds for reopening or on what basis countries or communities should make these types of decisions. We're just saying that R in some form will be one of the factors. So let's see how it affects the data that everyone is looking at. Thanks, Alan. So let's take a look at a few examples of various R values and see their impact on the spread of disease over time. So remember that R is the multiple of new cases that existing cases generate on average while they're infectious. So when the R is one, this means that when there's say 100 infected people, those 100 people will directly infect 100 new people. Now over time, this means the disease will stay stable. The current cases do not meaningfully go up or down over time, that is without any other interventions. When the R is say greater than one, let's say 2.0, with those same existing 100 cases, those 100, while they're infectious, will spread the disease directly to 200 new people. So the existing cases will continue to increase and the number of new cases will also increase over time. This means the disease is expanding. Right now, as Alan mentioned, without any interventions, the R value for COVID-19 is estimated to be between three and six. Now, keep in mind, three and six are huge numbers, but remember, you can knock those R values down a lot with various interventions to impede the transmission of the disease, like isolating people who are infected, social distancing, wearing protective masks. These can all help slow down the transmission and reduce that R value. But see, even a smaller number that feels closer to one, like say 1.5, doesn't do much to stop the spread. Going from 2.0 to say 1.5, and then even to say 1.1, we'll still see the disease expanding. And quickly, depending on the time period. Getting R2 at least as low as one, where the disease isn't growing, is what you see states and countries talking about as they discuss reopening. When the R is less than one, say 0.8, this means that our 100 existing cases will spread the disease directly to only 80 new people 
in the time period. So over time, the existing cases will keep declining because more people recover than new people are getting it. If we wait long enough, there will be so few cases that the disease effectively dies out. Kevin, I think it's important to note that if people think they're new to this R concept, they're really not. The same concept has played an important role in their life already, and I think they have some instinct about different values of R. For example, in your retirement plan, if you're growing at 15% a year, that's an R of only, quote, air quotes there, 1.15, but that's a huge R. You're, you're going to be thrilled in retirement if you have an R of 1.15. Similarly, things you want to decline, you know, like just let's just say you have some uranium in your basement, and who among us doesn't, truly? If it decays at 10% a year, that's an R of 0.9, which is still huge you're going to still have a lot of uranium in your basement for a long time because that's a very long half-life you want an r of a lot less than 0.9 and, and frankly that's where what we're all looking for here with the coronavirus but we all know and even some very important elected officials are all becoming very conversant in r you see this graphic from the bbc when the uk was estimated to have had an r of about four in early March, they got it what looked like below one by the end of the month by closing schools and adopting social distancing. Okay, now we're talking about maybe opening schools in some countries, Europe, the United States perhaps, uh, and you had Marco Agelli, a, uh, an epidemiological uh, expert in Italy, say that, look, you know, you might be at 0.8, but opening schools might be 0.3, and all of a sudden you're back at that 1.1. It can be devastating. And then in late April, you had the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, say that, hey, 1.1 might sound great, but if we have a 1.1 for a while, by October, we're going to reach the capacity of our healthcare system. And if it was 1.2, we're going to reach it in June. And she said, that's where you see how small the margin is. And here in New York, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, said that as the state plans and, and experiences reopening, he said, when it be R, if it ever hits 1.1, he literally said, alarm bells are going to go off. As we recap this episode and wrap it up, I'd like to highlight our three takeaways. So the reproduction number, or R, is the number of new cases that existing cases generate on average while people are, are infectious. Remember, the R value is not fixed. It fluctuates over time as various interventions, or in some cases, lack of interventions, are implemented. And remember, R is a crucial number that countries and states are looking at when they're thinking of loosening both social and economic restrictions in various ways. I feel like we've done an episode of Sesame Street where this episode was brought to you by the letter R. And remember, we did this because as viewers write in, we try to answer their questions. So if you want us, dear viewer, to cover something that you've seen in the media or online, please comment below and include data, excuse me, hashtag be data brilliant in your social post or email us at hello at the data literacy So thanks folks, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon.